In this video, we're going to look at the virial equation. And to start this conversation, I want us to think about how a real experimental isotherm might compare to an ideal isotherm. And so that's what I've plotted out here. So this is an isotherm, uh, varying pressure and volume with respect to constant temperature. So let's say that these were both um, calculated and taken at the same temperature, right? So this will be the ideal isotherm at a particular temperature and the experimental isotherm at a particular temperature. Now this is a rather crude drawing, but this is more or less what you would expect, right? At high volumes and low pressures, there will be very little deviation between the ideal and the experimental curve whereas once you get to higher pressures and lower volumes then you start to see a much larger deviation of this curve right um, that's where they start to to see major differences so what does this tell us well this tells us that at low at low pressures and high volumes the ideal gas law does a pretty good job of uh, modeling reality so what that means is that the ideal gas law is a pretty good first approximation to modeling these gases. So the idea behind the virial equation is that you use the ideal gas law as a first approximation, and then you just do a power series expansion in order to account for higher order effects that aren't taken into account in the ideal gas law. So what that would look like right, is we will have P V bar right, for our ideal uh, gas pressure and volume, right, RT, right, and then we would just do a power series expansion. So that first term would be the ideal gas law, right, so we'll just put one there. Um, and then the next term would be a linear term with respect to pressure. And it'll have a coefficient in front of it that we'll call B, right, and then that's the pressure. And then there'll be a quadratic term will have a coefficient called C plus dot 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 right continuing on however long you want to uh, continue that series expansion for right now these coefficients are called virial coefficients so this B and C here are called virial coefficients These are just the coefficients in front of each successive expansion of the virial equation, right? But this is a rather intuitive idea, right? You're using uh, the ideal gas law as the first approximation here, and then you're just going to do a, a series expansion uh, in terms of pressure. Now, this is something that you have to get comfortable with. This is a very common technique in physical chemistry in general, is to take some good model that you know works well in spots but has its limits, and then you use that as a first approximation and do some general expansion in some variable that's related to the state function. Just do an expansion to account for higher order effects that the first approximation neglects, right? Now, this is an expansion with respect to pressure. Um, a more useful expansion uh, in many applications is um, expanding in terms of volume uh, instead. So what that expansion would look like is you would still have one here, right? But then you would say, okay, plus B over V bar, right? Plus, so that would be the linear term and one over V bar. Now you have C over V bar squared, right? Plus dot, 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 however long you want to extend that series to, right? Um, and just as a practical note, so in most practical purposes for many applications, when we're doing this expansion, we usually truncate at the second or third term. So we usually truncate at that linear term or the quadratic term. Usually the model, if, if the model's a good enough first approximation, you usually only have to include, you know, first or second order approximate uh, expansion terms in order to account for, you know, what it's neglecting, if it's a good first approximation. If you have to include a lot of higher order terms, then you're probably not starting from a good, you know, starting point. You're probably not starting from a good first approximation. Okay, cool. So this is the idea of the virial um, equation in a nutshell. And the B and C that you see here, it is the same uh, virial coefficients, right? B and C. So this is the general idea behind the, uh, the, the virial equation, right? Now, what you'll notice, uh, if we divide by RT, 
then that's just going to be our uh, compression factor, right? So let me use a different color for that guy. So the compression factor is just PV bar over RT, right? So everything else is just on the right hand side, right? That stuff from our expansion. And I'll use the volume expansion that's right above it, right? So C over V bar squared plus dot, 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 right? Okay, so this is actually really neat because now this gives us a ready physical interpretation of what these higher order expansion terms mean, right? We know that our compression factor is just um, telling us how much the real gas deviates from ideal behavior. So our expansion physically is collecting the interactions that allow the real gas to deviate from ideal behavior or cause the real gas to deviate from ideal behavior. So that's pretty neat. We have a really good physical interpretation of this expansion um, by use of, of the compression factor, right? So let's see what this looks like in practice. So let's take a real gas equation and do an expansion of it um, using this, this technique, right? So uh, let's take our van der Waals uh, compression factor. So we derived that in the previous video, right? So we have the compression factor for van der Waals gas, V bar minus B minus A over RT V bar. Right? Okay, so, um, so what we can do here is re-express this first term in the following way so that we can set up a series expansion, right? So let's re-express that first term in the following way. So we'll have one over one minus B, var, B, B over V bar. And then this term is left the same. Right now, to get this re-expression, right? So I didn't do anything with this term. To get this, you basically have to multiply the numerator and denominator by one over V bar, which is completely valid since you're basically just multiplying by one, which is one of the dirtiest tricks in mathematics. You basically just, you know, multiply the uh, numerator and denominator by the exact same thing, and you can just re-express anything you want, right? So. The reason why I'm re-expressing it in this way, though, uh, I'm doing that for a very specific reason. I'm doing that so that we can do a McLaurin expansion on this first term, right? So if you don't remember from calculus, a McLaurin expansion Right, so a McLaurin expansion uh, is a series expansion on terms that look like this. So 1 minus 1 over 1 minus x Right, you can expand that guy as 1 plus x plus x squared plus dot, 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 right? Um, so uh, in order to do this expansion, right, um, I had to get it in this form. So I've gotten it in this form so I can do the expansion of this first term. So I'm going to apply the expansion next and see what that looks like. And I'm only going to do this expansion for the first term, right? So um, doing the expansion on this first term, we've got one over one minus B over V bar, right? So we can re-express that guy as one plus B over V bar plus B over V bar squared plus dot, 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 right? So um, what we're going to do here, um, oh, yeah, so B, yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, this whole thing is squared. So we square this guy here. Wait, wait, no, no, no. Yeah, leave that alone. OK. So, um, so we have this, uh, these terms expanded, right? So we've done the McLaurin expansion. So from there, what we can do is truncate at this second term, right? So if we truncate at the second term, so we'll truncate at the second term,
then we're going to end up with z being equal to 1 plus b over v bar minus a over rt v bar, right? So, um, so this gives us the compression factor. So I basically truncated this guy at the second term. So I truncated right there, right? And plugged it back into the compression factor expression, right? So if we've done this, right, we've truncated at that second term, then we can actually solve for our second virial coefficient. So our second virial coefficient, if we just factor out everything that isn't um, one over V bar, right? then we end up with B minus A over RT, one over V bar, right? So this is going to be your second virial coefficient, B, right? So, um, so interestingly, this uh, second virial coefficient can tell you um, how much the real gas or the, the Van der Waals gas in this case is deviating from ideal behavior, right? So, and we can actually look at this guy, right? We see that everything's a constant except for temperature. So we can really write this as B as a function of temperature, right? And it actually gives us a really useful property. So we know that if this second virial coefficient is zero, then we basically have a gas behaving like an ideal gas, right? So think about it. if this term, this is the, the first term in the expansion. Usually when you're doing this type of expansion, that first term is the largest corre correction, right? Everything should get smaller at that point or else you don't have a convergent series. So since if this guy is zero, then we basically have an ideal gas. And that's going the temperature at which that occurs is going to be called the boil temperature. So the boil temperature is the temperature where the second virial coefficient is zero, right? So this is gonna be the boil temperature. Right, and we can actually use this uh, second virial coefficient expression for uh, the Van der Waals gas to solve for the uh, boil temperature for Van der Waals gas, right? So let's do that really quickly. So if we got B, minus a over rt right the boil temperature is where this is going to be equal to zero right and if we do some quick algebra then we get t is equal to a over rb right so this would be the boil temperature for van der waals gas right so this is the boil temp for van der waals gas specifically right so the boil temperature is any temperature where the second virial coefficient is zero so the boil temperature itself is more general than this expression but this expression is specifically the boil temperature for van der waals gas right so um essentially what we've done here right so we've we've introduced the concept of a virial of the virial equation and the virial coefficients and we have looked at the specific application to the van der waals equation right and also introduced this nifty little boil temperature definition uh where we can look at what temperature um a van der waals gas would mimic an ideal gas